so I have to wrap up with this pretty quickly. I don't want to run over and steal somebody else's time. And I think questions are probably left. Unless, unless I naturally have some time, fine. But if I have to rush through and finish, then let's keep the questions until the end um, to give everybody a chance to, uh, to, to, to present. Uh, before I start, a couple of um, credits to two sources on the internet, as usual, with um, a lot of things we do these days. There's always answers out there or places to get started with. And these two links, Chris Lissio from Super Mega Ultra Groovy, and David Stark with his own uh, website were the starting points for um, where where I needed to start. And I didn't end up <laughs> where they ended up, but um, at least they gave me the basic concepts for where to start. And if you want to search those, you can Google uh, something like iOS drawing audio waveforms. You'll find these. You'll find these links. Now we've all seen audio applications. Um, <coughs> Uh, rendering waveforms, the top one is uh, SoundCloud, it's a very highly stylized view of a waveform. Not very accurate, but it doesn't need to be. Um, these next two down here are, are Audacity. Uh, the middle um, waveform shows an entire song. Can anybody recognize that song? It's the Beatles, if um, some Beatles song, I can't remember. But, uh, but with Audacity, because it's an audio editing application, you have to be able to get right down to every sample and be able to edit every sample. So you can zoom down at discrete levels to, on this bottom graph, you can actually see dots that represent each audio sample on the input. So it can go from that full view of the file down to the sample level. The application we're going to be focusing on was one I introduced last week called Blue Box. That has two requirements. It has a high level, highly compressed or low resolution <coughs> summary at the top, which shows you the position in the file. That's the entire file being displayed there. And at the bottom, we've got a scrolling area as the music plays and scrolls by. And you can pinch in and pinch out to increase or decrease the, um, the uh, um, the resolution of, the, of that area. So what, I, what I'm going to do actually on this presentation, I'm going to start all the way at the end and talk about how we actually get the data on the screen first, ways and mechanisms of doing that. Then I'm going to go back to the beginning and see if we can work our way through to be able to accomplish the, the rendering itself. Um, the focus of the presentation obviously is, is the Accelerate framework, so I'll be contrasting some traditional code with Accelerate code, and that's really where I want to focus most of the presentation on. There's a secondary uh, concept I want to talk about if we have time, and that's uh, Affine Transforms, because I use Affine Transforms in a different uh, way in here as well. Those two things, Accelerate plus Affine Transforms, are some of the key components to getting this stuff done as quick as we can. Uh, so the two steps, acquire and prepare the data, and then render the data. As I say, we're going to go all the way to the rendering part first, then go back to the beginning and work forward. So there's two ways of rendering. Um, an older traditional way would be to draw vertical bars for every uh, granularity of sample that you wanted to, to display, one pixel wide, <coughs> one point wide. That certainly is um, the historical way of doing things. And I think SoundCloud pretty much does the same thing. It doesn't need a high level of granularity. And they're doing something fairly similar to that. The other option that we have, now we've got high power graphics um, machines under our fingertips, is to use vector graphics to draw the outline of a waveform and have the GPU fill in the, um, the shading behind, behind the scenes. There's a number of reasons why we want to focus on this technique. Uh, one is that it scales to any resolution we've got. We can easily um, increase or decrease the size of the uh, graphic that we're displaying and still maintain sharpness and crispness at the pixel level. Uh, another thing is we don't actually have to draw. With, with a vector graphics object, we don't actually have to draw it. We can actually use it as a clipping area. So we can have something behind that that we expose through the clipping area, which gives us a number of options uh, for interesting effects that you just can't get with the, with the vertical bar. 
In terms of the actual application itself, very quickly, uh, that top area is the. Comp this is how the uh, view objects are laid out on the um, in the application. Uh, the top is the complete waveform view. Um, every UI view comes built in with a CA layer underneath it. That's what actually um, contains the the um, the content. We've had to add two more shape layers underneath that. Um, as child layers of the CA layer, one to hold the cursor and the other one to hold the actual waveform itself. And on the complete waveform view, it's the cursor layer that actually moves to show movement in the file. The, the waveform itself is static and the cursor moves back and forth. On the scrolling area, we end up again with a UI view with its own CA layer. And underneath that, we build four more layers, one for the cursor, which in this case is static, and three other CA shape layers, which we then move those layers to simulate the scrolling of the waveform. And when we run out of space on that end, we flip this one over there and repopulate it, and we keep on going around like that until we're done with the file, and vice versa. So the key thing, the key issue here with this takeaway for this slide is you can see, um, I've written CG path on the CA shape layer. That's the <coughs> fundamental graphics drawing objects that we're using in, in this application. CG path, CA shape layer. Uh, let's just summarize what I've just said, actually. Um, the, the shape layer itself has a property called a path, which you just add the CG path to and the GPU will automatically render it. So this last penultimate line here, layer, set path, path, is where you actually stuff the layer with a new path and the GPA, GPU will, will render it. So the problem statement then, um, a path itself is a collection of CG points, and the CG <coughs> point as a structure is to CG floats representing an X and Y location on the screen. And this, the CA shape layer interprets that as a point to draw from one to another, to another, to another, to another. So as we push that array of CG points into the layer, it will take the first one, move to there, take the second one, draw a line to there, move to the third one, etc., etc., etc. So that's where we've got to get to. And the audio file itself is a ar double array stereo of float 32s, single precision floats. Um, one big array representing the right hand channel, and another big array representing the left hand channel. So, what we've got to do, we've got to get from there um, double array of float 32s to an array of CG points at some resolution lower than the original file. We want to actually condense down. So how do we do all this? Well, that itself is broken down into three steps. First thing is decimate, what I've called decimation of the file. We chop it up, condense it, merge it, average it, to get to a thing that I call the base decimation buffer. That's a buffer of single precision unipolar values representing potentially the top half of the waveform we're going to represent on the screen. From that, we don't sample again for every specific view. I've only got two views, but obviously if I had 10, there'd be no problem. I could just don't sample from that um, base decimation buffer as much or as little as I needed to. So we're going to step through each of these three steps. Decimation itself looks like this. At the top, we start off with a URL pointing to a file. We open that up as an AV audio file. We load it into an AV PCM buffer, AV audio PCM buffer. We read it into that buffer. And in that buffer, we've got pointers to the right and left channel. Again, just reiterating that those are all float 32s, and they're normalized to the value 1. In other words, 1 represents full scale, zero represents nothing. So they're all normalized already to, to lie between the values zero and one. 
the first thing we do is we downsample the left and the right channel separately. And during that process, we average the samples within a chunk. Let me, um, let me walk over and actually point it out. This is a chunk of the original file here. And from that, we average all the values in there, or we take the peak value. We'll come to which is better in a minute. And then we generate one output sample for each chunk going in. So what I've done is this initial downsampling is 64 times. So I condense by a factor of 64. That's purely experimental. It doesn't depends on your application whether you do it less or do it more. But with a down, initial downsampling of 64, it gives me the highest resolution is good enough for what I need to do. So we've downsampled, averaged, or peaked into um, two temporary buffers. The next thing we then do is we combine these two samples into one and take the absolute value of it at the same time. So we average those two, take the absolute value, and we end up with this base decimation buffer, which is, just to repeat, it's a unipolar, they're all positive values, they're um, downsampled by 64, so it's one sixty-fourth of the samples end up in here. And we use that as the base reference to, <coughs> to generate all the other uh, downsampling. Now we're going to take a look at a bit of source code to see how we do that. And this is where we introduce the... Uh, where we introduce the accelerate. Um, so, I'm going to look at this and look at there at the same time. What have we got here? This, first of all, this um, object we're looking at is the thing I call the ETB decimator. It's an object that all it does in the world is decimate files. And I've put four different, um, there's, some, there's a whole bunch of code above that, but the guts of it I've broken out into these four sections. The first section that you can see here that starts with if def average. Andrew, do you want to maybe just quickly change to presentation mode in Excel? How do you do that? Is that a little bit easier for people? Okay, okay. that's cool. Better? So we've got, I've, I've put all these sections in and there's, there's, a whole, there's a whole bunch of timing things in there which we can forget. This was just a time, how long it took to, to do things and I've got a summary of that uh, later. But uh, if we look at the manual averaging first, uh, there's nothing particularly complicated. There's a double loop here uh, for each of those chunks in the input. Uh, we add up all the values and we divide by how many values we've just added up to give us an average. And we store that average in the left and right temporary buffer. And then we come back again and for all of those samples in the temporary buffer, we take the absolute value divided by two so we're going to write it to an output buffer. So that output buffer is a natural factor, our base destination buffer. Nothing particularly complicated about that, works fine. It's not the fastest, we can do better. Um, so here, if we go up, we can see something that does exactly the same thing, but using the Accelerate framework. The first thing you can notice is there's no for loops in here. Not that for loops are a bad thing. In fact, I've got a point later on in the slide that um, shows that for loops can actually perform better in some cases than uh, Accelerate. But we've got these funky little calls here called uh, VDSP, DSAMP, two of them, VSM, SMA, VAPS, that was fairly obvious, but what, are these, what do these things do? So let's go back to the, um, presentation. So 
So a little bit about the Accelerate framework. Um, it's uh, a very massive um, framework. There's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of API calls, all C-based, um, broken out into uh, a whole different groups. And then the, the group that we're interested in, uh, that, you know, they have groups for image processing, uh, groups for a very large number of processing. Um, the one that we're interested in is the group that's all DSP related, digital signal processing related. The key thing with the Accelerate framework is that it's optimized to make maximum advantage of SIMD, which is single instruction, multiple data, doing the same thing repeatedly on a very large array of values is um, where this particular technique shines and that's obviously what <laughs> audio processing is it's a very very large number of samples that we want to process as quick as we can so accelerate framework um, works very well for us here let's take a look at one of the um, sample calls that i shown in the source code dsamp let's see what it does for us so the first parameter was just a pointer to your input buffer. That would have been in uh, the earlier slide, that would have been the actual audio PCM buffer itself. We've got a pointer into that. The next is the thing called a source stride. That's how many, how big a jump do you want to make in that source file? And I showed you the chunks that we were using ahead of time. In this case, I was using a factor of 64 there. The filter we'll come to in a minute, and because this is handling the left channel data, our next parameter is a pointer to the output buffer. This parameter is how many output values do I want to generate? It kind of works backwards. You declare what the output count is, then you have to make sure that you've got enough data on the input to satisfy that requirement. That's the way the API works. And Again, the same number applies to the size of the filter. So what is this filter thing? The filter is another little array of single precision floats that this call will take every value in here, will take a chunk of data. The first value in that chunk will multiply by the first value in the, the, in the filter and accumulate it. It will take the second value on the chunk, multiply it by the second value in the filter, and accumulate it. Dun, dun, dun. So if I put into that filter um, values of 1.0 divided by my chunk size, I end up with the average value coming out. I could put different values in there. If I put one in the first, just 1.0 in the first cell, and just picking off the first value in my chunk and using that. If I put one in all of them, I'll end up with an output value that is source side, is the summation of everything in that, in, that, um, in that chunk. So you can play with this to get the output you want. I obviously want an average value, so I divide everything by my count and add it all up. And that's it. Now that, on the input buffer on the uh, application I showed you, the input size is 256k. We take 256k chunks of the audio file and this one command rips all the way through that and generates an output buffer of 1 64th the number of samples. That's it. That's the first part. The second part is um, getting from those right and left down sampled buffers to the final base buffer. To do that we've got to take the right and left values, average them, add them and average them. And for that we use this function called V for vector, single value multiply, single value multiply and add. So it takes two input vectors, multiplies it by a scalar, adds the result together. So what we do is our first input vector is the left temporary buffer. The second input buffer is the right temporary buffer. For each value in that, our stride value is now 1, so we're stepping through every value, not skipping 64. Skipping through every one. We take the 
each value with a tem left temporary buffer and multiply it by 0.5, add that to the right temporary buffer, which we also multiply by 0.5, we end up with an output value that's the average of those two inputs. Then we take the ab absolute value of the whole lot. That gets us down to where we have our base decimation buffer ready to rock and roll. Just keeping an eye on the time here. Some timing analysis I did just to give you a sense of where this gets us. Test conditions, first of all, were um, the audio file was Procohara's Whiter Shade of Pale. It has 10.9 million samples in each channel, so right and left, total of 21.8 million samples altogether. It was running on my iPad Air. Um, we'll come to that last uh, content in a minute. Uh, A plus B, A is the first down sampling that I showed you, and B is the averaging and absolute value taking. I've just put boxes around the accelerate version and the manual one because those are the two pieces of code I've shown you. Uh, and the red numbers on this row is the total time it takes to do that for this test condition. These numbers are in microseconds, so using accelerate for average processing, we get to do all of that in 56.8 milliseconds. If we do it through the manual averaging, 399.9 milliseconds. So it's nine times faster to use Accelerate for that particular problem that I've shown you. I stress for that particular problem that I've shown you because one of the points I made right at the end of the file is that, uh, end of the presentation, is that um, Accelerate framework, you don't, don't work under the premise that it will always speak to everything up for you. Depends on your specific problem set, and you must test and try it first because you can end up doing things which, in actual fact, take longer through Accelerate. Accelerate has some overhead to set things up. We have to take that into account. So it's fairly substantial improvement of that particular problem. Step two um, is to further downsample and create this thing called a unit path. What is a unit path? Uh, this is where we go into the affine transform area. From our base decimation buffer, I then want to produce the final output that I'm going to put on the screen. To do that, I need to create an array of CG points where X and Y, X represents the point position in the layer I'm going to draw at, and Y represents the Y position, and join all of those dots. So to actually get from my base decimation buffer, again, that's unipolar, single precision, I've got to get to an XY double precision array. Two things I can do, again using accelerate framework functions. The first thing I can do is I use a ramp function that puts an increase in, atomically increasing number in each of the X positions. That represents where I'm going to draw on the X axis on my um, CA shape layer. X is equal to 0, X is equal to 1, up to N minus 1 and N. So this is how we do that. We just have a starting value, an increment value, pointer to the buffer, and we skip every other value. Dum, 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 all the way through. I can make that different, but all I want is an atomically increasing number because it represents the x-axis. Then we've got to get the data from the base bu destination buffer into the, um, into the y value of, of this, this array. And we can do that with this function. This is vector, single precision, double precision. That converts single to double, but it takes it from one place and puts it to another. So I actually use that to not only convert from single to double, but transfer that value from this buffer into this buffer. Output frame count is whatever it needs to be in terms of how much I'm dealing with at this point. 
and that gives us an array of CG points. We then stuff that into the CG path, a very, very simple process of just adding, adding lines, adding that array that are interpreted as points to connect, lines to connect. Then we've got a CG path, but there's one problem here, it's only the top half of the path. It only shows me the positive values, I need the negative values as well. So what I need to do is take that entire thing, flip it over, and add it back in so we get the top and the bottom. And that's done with this affine transform. What this does, and I'll explain how it does it in a little minute, it literally takes that entire array, multiplies the x value by minus 1, all the way through, multiply the x value by minus 1, and then adds it back, appends it back onto the path. So I end up with all the positive values, and then all the negative values appending, and when the GPU renders that, it will be a complete closed path. <coughs> it's a little bit mathematical, but um, I won't stay too long on this one, but just to give a sense of what the affine transformer is for anybody that hasn't gone into this um, uh, world, it's basically a 3x3 three three matrix. That's the, what the transform itself is. And what we do with that 3x3 three three matrix is we take an input matrix of 1x3 and we multiply it by that matrix. And again, that's exactly what the GPU is good at. It loves doing matrix multiplication. The way it does it is it takes the first value, multiplies it by, or I should say, multiplies the first value by A, second value by C, third value by T. So and we generate an x bar, ax plus cx plus t. Then it takes y and does that with that column. We don't need to worry about that column. If that matrix contained this pattern of ones and zeros, this is called the identity transform. It actually does nothing. And you can work that out. If it takes x, x plus zero y plus zero t. x is equal to x, does nothing. Same for y. But we start off always with an identity transform, and then we manipulate it. That one over here, if we look at what that does, take the first value, x, multiply by 1, so we get x, plus 0y, plus t, x plus t. x plus t is a movement across the x-axis. We've taken a point on the x, and we've moved it by a distance t. On the y side, we get... 0x plus y plus t. So it's taken a point on the y axis and moved it in some direction. So translation, it's taken an x and a y and moved it to some other x and a y. Here, and this one with the values, if we put values into S, x and s, y, we end up with the new value of x is equal to x times s. The new value of y is equal to y times s. We've scaled x and y by some number, 0 0.5, 2, 3, 10. And we've done the same thing with, um, with y as well. So from a point, we can multiply it or scale it up, scale it down, increase the width, increase the height, decrease it. And it's all done through a matrix like that. Now, there are other matrices as well for rotating things, where you have sine and cosine functions in there. We don't do any of that, but that's the basics of what transforms, affine transforms are, and they're used in, throughout all of um, CG core graphics in, um, uh, in iOS. If you want to know more about this, go and look at the Quartz 2D programming guide. It's got a nice dialogue on how this all works, plus an awful lot more about Quartz 2D. And you have five minutes. Five minutes, yeah, okay. So the final thing then, um, just go back and review that picture. We've got to draw these things into CG paths. And uh, again, the way we do that, and I've just taken the code out of uh, Xcode to show how it's done. Um, one of the, once we've got that um, uh, unit waveform, the first thing we have to do is we've got to scale it up 
we've got to position it halfway up the screen that we're wanting to draw it on because we've got positive and negative values now. We want to move it up to half the height. So we create a transform that multiplies the y by half the height of the actual physical screen. X doesn't change. And we apply that transform to this big matrix that we've already created, not move it up. What we do is we do this in the very last drawing cycle of the, as you probably all know, UI View has got a drawing cycle called Draw Rect, where you're supposed to do all the, the drawing. CA shape layers have a very similar concept. You define a function that does the actual drawing. And we do this final manipulation in that drawing function. So as we rotate the screen and the screen size changes and the draw rect effectively comes into play, it automatically adjusts to the size of the actual screen at that point in time. And once we've scaled that path, we add the path, we overwrite what's originally there um, to let the GPU go off and actually um, fill, uh, draw that or render it on screen. So that's pretty much it. Um, closing down now. Um, so the first point, I, first point I just made, I'll just reiterate, is that don't assume that um, uh, Accelerate Framework can solve every problem you've got uh, the, in a quicker way than other ways. Generally speaking, a for loop is very, very little overhead. It doesn't take much to spin through something. It's very, very little overhead. So if, if you're doing a for loop, don't worry about that. It's what it does inside the for loop you need to worry about. But always test, always test and try, because you may get some surprises. And I certainly did get some surprises when I tried different functions to try and get the different thing to work, and different functions work better than others. So always try, always experiment, always test. Um, generally speaking, Accelerate Framework works better on larger data sets. Obviously, it's less set up to run through eight. So the more, the bigger the data set and the fewer data sets you process, generally speaking, is good. And the final point is audio is fun. So that's it for me. Thank you very much.
Robert Marley, um, nine million samples. Did it? It got it all onto the screen in about just under two seconds. Um, the the interesting thing is that it only actually took 20, 56 milliseconds to build the data. So I still have some work to do to figure out where's all the other time gone. Well, 56 milliseconds and two seconds. Where's the rest of the time going? And I think it's also in iOS scheduling. I'm not doing this on the, on the highest priority thread. It's on the secondary priority. And I think, it, I think I can speed it up if I actually do it on the main thread, even though Apple says don't do that because you've got to keep your, uh, your application interactive. But on this application, there's nothing you can do until the data's up there. So I don't really think it matters if I ran it on the, on the um, UI thread. Um, that might speed the total time up. Um, all I showed you on that matrix was the raw time to, to, to chew this data. Mm. Is that actually a question? Yes, thanks. Thanks, Andrew.